During the events of Halo 2, we were first introduced, at least in gameplay, to the Brutes. Immensely strong, surpassing the strength of both Sangili and Spartan 2s, Jul Hane typically placed a greater emphasis on brutality than wisdom. They are considered to be a savage species as a whole. The Brutes we meet kept their fur cut and styled to emphasise their more intimidating physical attributes, and wore only an armoured skullcap, minimalist torso harness, pauldrons, and basic footwear. Preferring this potential for blind obedience, the High Prophet of Truth began plans to replace the Sangili with the Jilhane, slowly placing the latter in higher positions and giving them greater allowances than Sangili troops would receive. Finally, on Truth's orders, the Jilhane began a purge of the Sangili High Counselors and Commanders throughout the Covenant space, sparking a cataclysmic civil war known as the Great Schism that led to the dissolution of the Covenant. This conflict against the Sangili would continue well after the end of the Human Covenant War, and like the Sangili, the Jirohane would fight an internal civil war as well. The next time we encounter the Brutes, nearly the entire species had been clad in ornate, full-body power armour. The period of time which passes between Chief's first encounter with the Brutes within High Charity and Chief's first encounter with the fully armoured Brutes on Earth was 14 days. In just two weeks, the Brutes went from minimalist armour to wearing reappropriated elite honour guard armour to full body power armour. How? Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00, and today we're looking at the origin of the Brute armour and how they went from unarmoured to fully armoured in just two weeks. Let's do this. In order to establish the answer to this video's question, we must look at the culture and societal structure of the Brutes. Jurohani society is dominated by a fierce pack culture and focus on lineage. Familial bonds tie each member to the other, forcing them into states of berserker rage and desperate mourning for their fallen pack mates should one die in battle. Jurohani society is an authoritarian dictatorship controlled by the strongest male. Dominance is established by the social, martial and sexual success of the Patriarch. Patricide is a common side effect of the Patriarchy due to the ambition seeded within many Jirulhani to rise to the top of a hierarchy. Female Jirulhani generally serve as mothers and caretakers. No females have ever been observed in military roles. A Jirulhani's blood relation to another did not offer the subordinates immunity from discipline. Each pack is led by a prominent chieftain who wields a ceremonial gravity hammer passed from one leader to another upon his death to denote his status. A Jirohane becomes a pack chieftain by challenging the current chieftain to a mortal duel. The victor claims the title after executing the other. The chieftain rules his pack like his own empire. An individual's rank is measured by success on and off the battlefield, unlike the more martial Sangili. Interactions among the Jirohane are dominated by personal status, which they display through decoration and ornate armour. Jirohane exhibit a variety of grooming styles to denote their status and pack affiliation. Jirohane typically are either clean-shaven or sport mohawks, goatees or beards. However, some Jirohane packs do away with shaving altogether. Some Jirohane packs also adorn themselves with tattoos over their entire bodies. Due to their combative and aggressive nature, the Jirohane lack a single cohesive government. Instead, Jirohane society can be viewed as an extension of their pack structure, but with a number of different levels. Packs range in size and importance, with less important packs made up of largely Ungoy or Kigyar forces and led by a low ranked Jirohane, and more important packs led by a war chieftain and comprised of more experienced veteran Jirohane bodyguards. Alpha tribes and master packs are seemingly dominant clans or groupings consisting of multiple packs. Prior to contact with the Covenant, rival master packs reduced Jirohane society to a pre-industrial level through warfare. Skeins are the largest social division of Jirohane. Meta clans formed out of multiple packs sharing a similar philosophy and interests. A given skein is dominated by the most powerful clan within. During the first immolation, most Jirohane fell into one of two dominant skeins, the Ratol and the Veleth. The two skeins display stark cultural and political differences. The Ratol are considered more primitive and aggressive, while the Veleth are generally more sophisticated and open to new ideas. 
it is here where we find our first bit of interesting information regarding the Brutes and their use of armour. When the Covenant arrived at Doziak and absorbed the Jural Hane in 2492, the members of the Ratolskines adopted the Covenant philosophy but only believed for strictly practical reasons, ultimately the result of blind subjugation to power. This generated a cultural friction and competitive infighting common to their kind, but for the time being these tensions were controlled by Covenant leadership. Many Jorhane of this skein never completely believed in the Covenant religion or the Great Journey. Some looked upon the San Shayum with disdain for giving the Jorhane access to advanced technology, as these individuals did not want their species to become reliant on it. It just so happens that the leader of the Atoll, between the Brutes' integration into the Covenant in 2492 and the beginning of the Human Covenant War in 2525 was a Brute known as Macabus, who was also one of the first of the Covenant to arrive at Harvest as somewhat of a representative of the Covenant during the opening days of the war. The luminary aboard his ship told him that thousands of Forerunner relics to reclaim were on the planet. Unaware that the luminary was actually detecting humans, and the Forerunner word for human, reclaimers, had been mistranslated. The devout chieftain was soon shocked to learn that Dadab, an attending Ungoy deacon, believed that there was an oracle located on the planet. Being led to believe that the humans were surrendering the oracle, Macabus took the rapid conversion to Harvest's capital city of Utgard. However, the rapid conversion was damaged by the planet's mass driver as the humans fled aboard the tiara. Believing this was enough, Macabus' nephew challenged him for dominance of the pack and thus command of the Ratoll. Having yet to fully heal from an injury, Macabus was overwhelmed. Macabus' last words to his nephew were, Never forget the meaning of this age, nephew. His nephew then crushed his skull with his own gravity hammer while he clung onto a ladder. Macabus' body plummeted into the explosions and fires below. His nephew then became the chieftain of the pack and the Ratoll, stripped Macabus' body of his chieftain armour and wielded his gravity hammer, the infamous Fist of Rucked, and proclaimed himself as Tartarus, chieftain of the Jural Hane. Tartarus was now the leader of all the brutes in the Covenant, and being from the Ratoll scheme, he held the same beliefs that they shouldn't become reliant on technologies of the Covenant somewhat enforced this particular belief over the Brutes directly under his command, resulting in these Brutes being largely unarmoured. But other Brutes within the Covenant at various times before, during and after Tartarus' rule as Chieftain of the Brutes were witnessed wearing more ornate armour. It is largely suspected that these Brutes may likely have been from the Veloth scheme, being more progressive and open to new ideas than the Ratoll. This may have been a contributing factor as to why the Brutes of the Covenant directly under Tartarus' command up to his death favoured more crude equipment and remained largely unarmoured. In favour of their naturally resilient and powerful physicality, with the Brutes further from his direct influence and from the Veliath perhaps being more armoured, but this isn't the only contributing factor. The Jurulhane serve in the Covenant military deployed as heavy infantry and shock troops, most of the Jurulhane roles within the Covenant were only mere extensions of their clan-based organisational structure, albeit more formalised under the Covenant's rule. The Covenant settled Jurulhane on worlds rich in resources to guard them from anyone seeking to claim them for themselves. Meanwhile, the Jurulhane lacked the capability to mine the resources themselves and were not provided the technologies necessary for the process, ensuring that the Prophets had secure control over the resources. Upon the Jurahani's inclusion into the Covenant, a group of Sankili commanders went before the Covenant High Council and claimed that the Jurahani's pack mentality would inevitably bring conflict between the two species. Citing the Jurahani's natural instincts to fight to the top of any hierarchy, the Sangili commanders proposed that any peaceful urges that the Jurahani exhibited should be aggressively encouraged. The High Council believed that the argument was fair and began to impose restrictions on the technology the Jurulhane could access. Although this ruling was meant to curb the enmity between the Sangili and the Jurulhane, a feud between the two species continued nonetheless. This may be the other contributing factor as to why the Brutes didn't widely adopt power armour. 
the feud between the Sangili and the Jirohane, and the Council's decision to limit the Brutes' access to more sophisticated technology as a means to mitigate the risks of the Brutes resorting to their baser instincts and attempting to rise to the top of the Covenant's power structure. It was only upon the outbreak of the Covenant Civil War, the Great Schism, that the Brutes, with the support of the Prophets, ultimately rose to the dominant military power of the Covenant. With the death of Tartarus, a leader from the Ratol scheme with powerful inclinations to remain largely unchanged by the Covenant technology, and this power shift within the Covenant military now seating the Brutes at the top of the Covenant, this created the opportunity and likely the insistence that the Brutes be given full, unbridled access to the Covenant's technology, as well as being outfitted with full body armour to more comprehensively facilitate the Brutes' position as the protectors of the Hierarchs and the heads of the Covenant military. But this still doesn't explain where the armour came from. It just justifies why Brutes didn't have the armour at earlier stages, but did when they became the leaders of the Covenant military. But it doesn't explain how an entire faction of the Covenant were fitted with bespoke, ornate power armour systems in just two weeks. Well, to answer this portion of the question, we must look further back into the Brutes' history and up to Contact Harvest. The first immolation, sometimes described as the Great Civil War, was a vicious, decade-long Jirulhane civil war that took place on the species homeworld of Doizak. The conflict was the culmination of a number of prior wars and ultimately led to the devastation of civilization on the planet. Prior to the first immolation, the Jirulhane had recently become a technological Tier 4 species, achieving rocket-based spaceflight and establishing colonies in Oth Sonin system. While the Jirulhane are divided into numerous pack-like clans, almost all of the clans were divided into two prominent schemes, the arguably primitive Ratol and the more sophisticated Veileth. These skeins were profoundly different in both culture and philosophy, with both sides having different means to pursue power. Despite the technological progress the Jirulhane achieved, their pack mentality and ritualistic warrior culture led to inevitable conflict between both schemes. This technological advancement to Tier 4 and their warrior-like nature likely led the Jirulhane to adapt and advance likely more primitive armour that would inevitably have been developed given the prevalence of wars within their culture. Brutes have, for as long as they have had the ability to do so, made and worn armour. Their technological advancement would have led to massive advancements in this armour, more so out of necessity as the Brutes' conflict-orientated thinking would have led to impressive and brutal advancements in their weapons technology, so advancing their armour would be of paramount importance to offset the threat of opposing clans' weaponry, and thus use every advantage possible to assure their ultimate triumph. Their armour would have been as much a part of their day-to-day -day lives as their weapons and their fierce physical prowess. Upon integration into the Covenant, this armour would have been continued to be used. Indeed, in the early days of the Human Covenant War, Macabus, his nephew Tartarus, and those under his command all wore full body armour that bears a near identical resemblance to the power armour we see them wearing from November 17th, 2552. Their armour has always been present, but likely due to the ideals of the Ratol and the Covenant Council's limitation of brute access to technology, their armour was likely akin to being in storage. Upon Tartarus's death, and the Brutes' promotion to military leaders of the Covenant, their old armour would have found a new purpose. Further to this, their armour would likely have been upgraded with power armour systems, specifically a form of energy shielding. The armour doesn't augment the speed or strength of the wearer, but the shielding is very different from the personal energy shields used by the elites. It appears as though the armour itself is actually somewhat held together with an energy field. The armour appears to be fitted to the wearer, but the connection points have likely had to have been altered to allow an energy conduit to run between what appears to be the power cells on the armour to the various components of the armour, facilitating the energy field ability to fully envelop the armour and the wearer. These altered connection points result in being points of weakness when the energy shield fails. This failure seems to create a backflow or short circuit of energy which damages the connection points to failure. The result is that once the shields fail, the armour plating simply falls apart. An upgrade of this kind could likely be performed in moments by a Hurigok, and likely in an hour or so if done so on a kind of assembly line or production line by the Yanmi. 
So finally, we have our answer. The armor has always been a part of their culture. It was not worn by brutes under the command of Tartarus and part of the Ritol scheme within the Covenant due to their ideals, but was worn by brutes further from his direct command and members of the Veloth. Upon his death and the brutes' appointment as the heads of the Covenant military, this armor was then widely worn by all brutes and was likely rapidly upgraded with power armor components by the Huragok and Yanmi on an assembly line, and by the time the events of Halo 3 came around, the vast majority of truths attending attachment of brutes were fully upgraded to be the fully armored, devastating and terrifying brutes we know and love. How was that for an explanation? Thanks for watching. Stick your comments down below. I look forward to what you have to say. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons, so Tenchi, the silent cartographer, Brian, Sebastian, Red Sea, Darian, and Neek, the holders of the mantle, Ty, Black Biscuit, J Rabbit, Austin, Kaiser, Silux, Reclaimer216, The Revanche, Wolf Slim, and Andre, my reclaimers, Zach, Deep Cover, Verbal Statue, Spesigo, Spartan A498, Guppy, Josh, Mickey, Bastion, Molshar, Slithery Tube Dude, Night Rides, Sierra G059, and Alpharius, my Metarchs, and all the other patrons that have jumped aboard to support the channel. You guys are awesome, and all of this wouldn't be possible without you. If you like Halo or discuss to insane levels of detail, hit that subscribe button and the little bell icon so you're told the second a new video hits the shelves. Be sure to support us on all major social media channels, including Discord, and if you really love the channel, consider heading over to Patreon and supporting the channel over there. It would mean the world to me and would free up more of my time for me to put into this content and other Halo-related goodness. Take it easy, everyone, and find peace in the domain. <laughs>